Good morning or afternoon, everybody. Today we have uh, Augusto Teixeira that will talk about the coupling from cylinder percolation. Augusto. Thank you very much, Pablo. Thanks for the invitation, the presentation. Can you see my mouse pointer? Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is based on a joint work with Caio Alves. Um, and I'll mention some of the previous works we had with also Bladas, Marcelo, and other previous works from Kai Without Me. So try to give some historic background. So first, what cylinders percolation is? I'm gonna define the model rigorously, don't worry, but I wanted to give a taste of what it is. This is a nice simulation done by Caio, uh, 3D rendering, which is quite rare in probability communities. People don't know how to do these things, Kyle knows. So uh, this is what, is, what is it that we are looking at? We have a model that's gonna give us a random subset of R3 in this case. And this subset is in the whole R3. So it's very hard to visualize it. So the way Kyle found out to visualize it, it's to cut a ball of the set. And now we can see it because you know, you can see through, uh, but this is an infinite set that extends. It's actually ergodic throughout the Z3, uh, sorry, R3. And this model was introduced by Tikeso and Vindish uh, in 2010 by a question from Itai Benjamin. So we're gonna define this random subset of uh, the Euclidean space in two ways. So the first way is the following. Um, we have the space of lines, L, so all lines in RD. And there is an abstract result that says that there exists a measure on the space of lines. And up to multiplicative constants, this measure is unique. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's the unique measure that is invariant with respect to the isometries of uh, the Euclidean space. So you, if you have seen, for example, this is very similar to to the uniqueness of the Lebesgue measure. The Lebesgue measure is a measure on points of the, of, uh, the Euclidean space and up to multiplicative constants is the unique one that is invariant with respect to the isometries of RT. But there is an analog result uh, in the Euclidean space for lines. Uh, I'm going to give a more concrete definition because this one is a bit abstract. It's a kind of existence result. But after you have this measure mu, you can define the cylinder uh, percolation. What do you do? You take a Poisson point process on the space of lines with intensity measure a constant times mu. Let's call this constant u. So you have a, several points in space of lines. And for each of these lines, you put it in RD. So now I have a soup of lines and we're talking about cylinders here. So we're gonna define CU to be the union of all the cylinders where the X is, is given by one of these lines in the Poisson process and the radius is one. And VU is the vacant set for the cylinders. It's just a complement. So what we're seeing here is a ball of radius, I think 30 intersected with the cylinders uh, CU at some intensity. Augusto? Yes. Just a quick question, maybe it's, it's very silly, but uh, up to rescaling, is that the same of uh, as uh, fixing your Poisson point process and playing with the radii of the, of the cylinders? Yeah, if you reduce the radii from one to a half, it's equivalent to reducing the density and then scaling the whole space. Okay, thank you. There is this uh, invariance of the process, which is quite nice. In the space of lines where you have no radii, the, the isometry is even simpler. Change the density or zooming out and in are equivalent in terms of law. So now that we have one definition, I'll give an, another one just to be more concrete. So what you do is you take a Poisson process. Think that the lines already have dimension one. So we don't want to have too much, too many points to start 
draw in our lines. So what we do is we to start with a plus one point process in a one less dimensional space, R D minus one times zero. So it's a hyperplane. And from this point, we're gonna draw lines. And the way we do it is quite specific. We're gonna draw lines at random directions from each point. And this is done, the direction is chosen for each point in an IID way. And the angle that we choose is random. The density is proportional to cosine of the angle with the vertical direction, the, the direction that is missing the hyper perpendicular to the hyperplane. So now after we do this, we thicken the lines and we get our process again. It's good to have this, defin this different definition. There's even a third definition <laughs> that I'm not presenting because it becomes a nice exercise to show they're all equivalent. And after you know that they are all equivalent, you get uh, very nice properties from each of them, right? If you want to prove something, you go to the definition that's easy to prove that something. For example, if you want to count how many cylinders touch a ball uh, in, in law, this is a more convenient definition than the first one. Okay. okay. So some properties from the model that were proved right in the first paper where the model was introduced. It's of course a law that is invariant with respect to isometries of uh, the Euclidean space. This is inherited from the Haar measure. Uh, the density of the cylinder set varies as we vary the intensity parameter u. If u is very small, you have very few cylinders in the picture. The density of Cu is very small, it's close to zero. As u goes to infinity, you start to cover the space more and more, and the density of the cylinders goes to one. Uh, this process, viewed as a random subset of the Euclidean space, is ergodic and mixing. Uh, one way to see that it's mixing is to look at this decoupling inequality that was from Tigerson and Vindish. Suppose you have two boxes, A, A and B, with, ray, with side length r and distance s. And you define a function that only looks at the configuration of this soup in the first box and another function g that only looks in the second box. If these functions are bounded away from, like if they're, uh, they're bounded from, if they're from minus one to one, like they have bounded infinite norm, their covariance is smaller or equal than u, a constant times u, the intensity of the process, uh, radius square over distance to the d minus one. So there is a bound on the covariance. This already gives that the process is mixing because as we make these boxes go further and further away, the covariance goes to zero. So that gives us mixing, uh, but it's more quantitative. It's a, it's a nice result, although it's polynomially decaying. So the polynomial decay there is really terrible. Uh, and it's related to the probability that one cylinder touches both balls. If there is a cylinder touching both A and B, you start to feel the dependence between them. And that probability is reasonably approximated by this uh, term there. Not only the dependence is slowly decaying as a polynomial with bad degree, but also the dependence is quite rigid. It's a, I don't want to get into details of how to define this rigidity of the dependency, but just think that if you look at the full box A, you, you know, for example, you have inspected the whole, you know, condition on the whole configuration in the box A, and you see a cylinder going towards the box B, you already have some information that you, you're not gonna forget. Even as the box B gets further and further away, if it stays aligned with that direction you saw the cylinder going, you always have information. So this rigidity of the conditional dependence is also bad to analyze the... Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Hello. Hello. Uh, is, is, is this bound on the covariance sharp? Is there a lower bound that roughly says that yeah. it's the right answer? So if, for example, the functions f and g, if the boxes have side length one and the functions f and g are uh, just the occupation variant, though, like is the box touching the cylinders or not, then the, the lower bound, there's a matching lower bound. 
uh, because it, it's it's going to be the covariance is going to be exactly the probability related to the probability that one seen the touch both points. Thank you. So what do we know about this um, model, not in terms of the model itself, but in terms of percolation, right? As we analyze it as a model for percolation, we can start, for example, doing simulations. So I, I'll explain what these simulations are. We take a this giant ball and we drill the cylinders, but we look at the vacant set now. Uh, the vacant set is pictured in the left. Um, and you can see that it's quite com uh, well connected. Actually, this is in red, you see a, the largest connected component. So you see that it's quite big. But as you increase the parameter U, more cylinders enter the picture, and the thing starts to fragment quite a bit. In the picture in the right, you see the, the connected components for U large. And you see that it's, uh, it's quite disconnected now. So that's a question. Is there a phase transition going on for percolation on the uh, vacant set of cylinders as we vary the parameter U? Um, this is inspired, of course, by percolation on independent uh, environments and inspires the definition of U star. U star is analogous to PC for independent percolation. It's the infimum of views for which the probability to see an, if, uh, an unbounded path from the origin is zero. So you expect that if U is very large, this probability should be zero, like the right picture indicates. And if the probability, if the intensity is small, it should, there should be a chance. And indeed, it was proved in the original work of Tikus and Vindish, uh, almost the full picture. So for all dimensions, it was proven that U star is finite, meaning there is a subcritical phase for large intensities. And for d big O equal to four, there is the subcritical, the supercritical density for small values of U, you percolate. The only missing piece was the three-dimensional case uh, supercriticality that was later settled in this joint work with uh, Ilario and Sidoratos. So I, I'd like to emphasize an interesting aspect Usually, a, a, a very nice technique to prove that there is an infinite cluster is to restrict your model to, to, uh, to a plane, right? Uh, in the plane, you have duality, and you can try to show that you percolate because dual paths don't survive. It's hard to build a dual path around the origin. So restricting to the plane is a very uh, efficient technique to show the existence of an uh, infinite cluster. But in three dimensions, this model restricted to a plane never has a supercritical phase. So the va vacant set intersected with a two-dimensional plane is always cut off uh, by these cylinders. The cylinders, when they intersect the plane, they become ellipsoids that are very heavy-tailed, and they kind of um, damage your whole space enough that you never see a supercritical phase. So it's already showing that you know, the model has teeth somehow. Uh, what are other interesting results around this? So if instead of looking at the vacant set, you look at the cylinders themselves, they're quite well connected. So of course, if you're just looking for an infinite connected component, that's very easy because one cylinder itself is already infinite. So you're going to see a positive chance with positive probability of a path from the origin to infinity. That's just being hit by a cylinder is enough. But actually the cylinders themselves are well connected. If you take any two cylinders, you can find a connection between them using at most D minus two other cylinders. And this is sharp. For every configuration, you can find two cylinders that cannot be joined by D minus three others. Um, also, if you, as I said, if you restrict the process to the um, plane, you have some anomalies in uh, ellipses percolation you get from there. It's quite anomalous. It has a phase transition, but it's a weird one. It's not a typical 
percolation versus non-percolation. It's related to how fast things decay. This, this indeed has a phase transition. I'm not going to enter into the details. Um, you, this model has been studied in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, how many cylinders you have to put in the picture to cover a large ball? That's an interesting problem of, about covering that was so studied by Brom and Mussini. And also this model has a fractal counterpart, which has been studied as well, which you can think of as kind of a Mandelbrot analog of this model, which is quite interesting as well. Um, now that we've talked you know, about the model, the percolation on the model and some other side uh, quests that have been <coughs> analyzed, um, we go to the main topic of the talk, which is decoupling. So decoupling is a term that's getting a lot of attention recently. It was around for long, longer, but now it's getting more traction again. And I'll explain what I mean by decoupling using other models as example, then we talk about the coupling force. So this is a very pictorial thing. You should not see this as a rigorous description of anything. But I wanted to give this, this flavor that percolation models can be very well mixing, like in the right to have IID percolation. It's as mixing as it gets. And you know, in the middle, I ha have an example of Boolean percolation, where these balls of random radii are scattered around the plane. This is quite well mixing as well, but not as good as IID. And your extreme left, you have the uniform spanning tree of Z2, which is, you know, it's still ergodic, but it's, it's kind of bad. It's very hard to deal with the dependencies, the intricate dependencies that this model has. So in, the, in this line underneath, you have some rigorous terms, for example, ergodicity, mixing, exponential mixing, in the more like dependent part. And in the right, have IIT and K dependency. Although, don't at all think that this is a line. You know, this is a multidimensional space. You can have two notions of mixing that are uncomparable with each other. Like you can have two notions of mixing between quotation marks where one model satisfies one but not the other and the another model satisfies them the other way around. So it's a complicated notion, that notion of mixing. And we're going through a few definitions of mixing that I find useful for studying percolation. <coughs> another caveat I'd like to raise is to be careful about some models where the dependence, like the FK, easy model plots, models from statistical mechanics, often the dependence is emerging as a feature of the model. So for example, the FK model, it's very heavily dependent around criticality. It's, it's, it, the model itself is introducing the dependence as the phase transition occurs. So it's not like we can give for FK an easy statement like this decoupling one. The de this decoupling for cylinders, it doesn't look at all at the phase transition happening. It's a uniform thing. For FK, the, the decoupling would be strongly uh, related to the existence of phase transition itself. So let me- Another question, another question. Why, why do you call it decoupling instead of you know, polynomial uh, decay of correlations. I'm just. Yeah, that's. Um, that's just the culture. <laughs> that's probably cultural. The, the, probably the, when the results were just about the covariance between two points, it was I'm I probably see. for decades called <laughs> decay of correlations. Uh, as you start to look at more complex functions and in balls that grow together with their distance, then techniques of coupling started to become very uh, useful. So I think they, they changed the term. Brian, that time. Thank you. <laughs> so for example, here's a, a very incomplete list of models for which decoupling have been studied and percolation as well. 
And in the beginning, you can see these works by Mr. Roy, Sarkar, uh, in Boolean percolation, then a long list of works for Voronoi, uh, random interlacements more recently. So all these works, they, they carry a lot of weight in the sense that they prove that the model decouples in a, in a way or mix somehow. And then they use these results to prove results about percolation on the model. They are, um, you know, very deep results. And what started happening more recently uh, is that maybe my generation got a bit lazy and we started separating these two things. So we now have some papers where just show decoupling perhaps with some small application. And then there were other results where you just assume that the decoupling works and you prove something. So I'm gonna explain what I mean by this in the, late, in the later slide, but there was this somehow specialization going on. Some people like to prove that models decouple and some people like to assume that models decouple and prove results about them. And one of the reasons is because the decoupling sometimes get very big. The, the papers become big and it's, you know, at some point you decide to just finish the paper. But uh, this was the case for uh, random interlacement with this article with Sergey Popov. I, I will give examples later, but I wanted to give this, uh, I want to ask for, uh, for an apology in advance. The result that I'm gonna present is more a decoupling itself. It's not so exciting in terms of the applications, although I'm gonna give us more application of energy. Uh, so what are examples of such results? So for example, these we already talked about, to have two functions, F and G, supported between quotation marks in two boxes, A and B, that have side length R and distance S. If you can prove that the covariance uh, no matter what the functions f and g are, the case like epsilon of s and r, this is a decoupling network. For example, uh, this is a, a result you can prove using renormalization. If your epsilon function decays polynomially with s and grows polynomially with r, but the exponent in s is bigger than the exponent in r, you already have a phase transition. So pc, for percolation on that model is gonna be strictly between zero and one. So that's very nice. It's a, it's a general result that was helpful. For example, in Nittman's original paper on interlacement, that's what showed the existence of a phase transition for large dimensions, dimensions more than seven. And for seamless percolation, that was used in the result that works for dimensions larger than four. Uh, it's not uh, going all the way down to low dimensions because this alpha and beta relation is not valid throughout the, the, the dimensions. <coughs> so this is one type of uh, decoupling inequalities and usually for these models that present some sort of conservation, right? If you see a cylinder, you know the cylinder is not gonna disappear. So there is some conservation. Usually there are these polynomial decays uh, in the function epsilon. And this is what leads to results that are not always optimal. I'm not gonna define what interlacements are. Here's a nice simulation I've done. Uh, it's enough to say that it's a, not a process, that it is a godic translation invariant. It's now in the discrete lattice at D, not in the continuum. Uh, it has decay of covariances, like I said, R to a power S to minus another power. And these powers are as such. Uh, and in the original paper by Znitu, and this is a very deep paper, he not only showed this polynomial decay with uh, fixed polynomials I showed you before, but he gave another stronger decoupling inequality. Uh, it's very implicit. You're not going to find this statement clearly in the paper, but if you read through some proofs, you're going to find it hidden there. So take two boxes that are very far away. So S should be much, much bigger than R for the result to hold. Take those two functions F and G, but now you require them to be increasing. 
And now another important change, you're not gonna use the same intensity U to measure the covariance. So look at the inequality there. The expectation of the product is bounded by the product of the expectations plus an error, but the parameter U we are using for the first expectation is different from the parameters in the right hand side. So in a sense, what this inequality is telling you is that you are using sprinkling, like changing a little bit the intensity of the process to blur the dependence. And now your decay, your error term is much, much smaller. You can take any power K and you can get such a result S to the minus K. So instead of having a fixed polynomial, like uh, in, the, in the previous slide, D minus two, which is fixed and you cannot improve, by using this sprinkling technique, you can get very fast decays. And this idea is going to be very important in the cylinder case as well. Of course, this is just one part of the bound and the covariance. It's just bounding the product of the expectations by the, ex uh, sorry, the expectation of the product by the product of the expectations. But the other way around, at least for increasing functions like we are treating now, this comes for free by FKG. So this is actually the upper bound is the, the interesting one for us. So here's a long list of results of this spirit. First, um, mentioning my work with Sergey, where we also take random interlacements as an example, but we now don't uh, require the functions to be so far. They can be very, very close together. You can see that the expectation of the product is also bounded by a product of expectations with a slightly higher uh, density. The functions should also be increasing. And the decay is a stretched exponential. So it's a very good decay. Um, but the biggest change in this article is the fact that the boxes don't need to be very far away. They can be uh, logarithmically close. Similar results were established by Caio and Sergey in a conditional uh, uh, result for an interlacement. I'm not gonna say what conditional means, but it's a stronger result than the one above. Balash has studied this for the Gaussian free field. Similar results holds there as well. Uh, Caio and Artyom studied the coupling for a random walk loop, loop soup. It's uh, very different in spirit what happens there. Uh, Pierre-Francois studied the ginzburg landau model. Uh, Rangel and myself, we studied similar decouplings for the zero range process and the simple symmetric exclusion. Auto? And, yes. So, a quick question. Uh, so, uh, the coupling seems to be proof for, for all the models, no? So there is a reason why you expect the coupling to happen like in general, or uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I found a model on, on the street, uh, how can I say whether it would have the coupling or not? Yeah, that's still very much uh, working by examples. Okay. You look at your favorite model and you start trying. Um, I, that's not, I think you would have a lot of fun working on these problems because usually this becomes interesting when you have conservation, right? All the models I'm mentioning here, if you see a cylinder, you know the cylinder is gonna be there. If you see a trajectory for the random interlacement, you know it's not going anywhere. All these models have conservation, the range excluded. And that's what makes the, the decoupling harder. And for example, the Asymmetric simple exclusion process is a very nice open question that I don't claim is, is hard at all because I tried a little bit and I'm far from a specialist and I, I didn't see a major obstacle, but I also didn't see a major uh, path forward. So I think it, the people from hydrodynamic limits should look into this. Uh, so the, the takeaway is these decouplings are very nice. 
In the presence of dependency, usually you have polynomial decays of uh, dependence, but in the presence of, uh, sorry, conservation, you have the polynomial decay of dependence, but you can try to get a super polynomial decay. And it's been done several times. It's usually involves some work and it's model specific and usually involves assuming the functions you're trying to decouple are monotonic and given a small sprinkling. That is the key to blur the dependence or dominate the dependence. All cited works use this monotonicity plus sprinkling argument. And how does it look for cylinders? So we tried to do this for cylinders for a while and didn't manage and finally we have something. So this is the result. Um, I know it's a, a mouthful, but I'm going through each part. It's not very different from what we've seen before. So first difference we're going to do is to define the cylinders with arbitrary radii. Instead of balls around the lines with radius one, you're going to define it with radius rho. So we allow to study the model in different, uh, different radii. So now I fix some parameters. Epsilon is going to be the size of your sprinkling in the intensity of cylinders, the density of cylinders. Now, there's another parameter delta, which is, sorry, I mixed it up. Delta is the <laughs> sprinkling in the density. And there's another parameter epsilon, which is the sprinkling in the radii. So you're going to compare the expectation of fg with the expectation of f expectation of g but the product you're going to take with the sprinkling both in the intensity and in the, the radii functions f and g should be increasing as usual and the distance should be much larger than the the side length of the boxes with this power there two plus alpha two. <coughs> then we get instead of a polynomial decay a uh, stretched exponential decay, which is very nice. Um, you may be scared that we are sprinkling this radius of the cylinder. Isn't the model going to look so different? Uh, not, it's not that bad because usually when you use these decouplings, you use them in a renormalization argument, for example, so that your sprinklings are going to be summable. So you do a small sprinkling in the next scale, do an even smaller sprinkling. And in the end, you do a finite sprinkling in the radius as you accumulate all of this. So you can see there that is a fast decay. The sprinkling happens in both parameters, radii and intensity. It's uh, similar to a conditional result, although it doesn't show in this statement there, but we have a statement that is more conditional looking. And a big problem with this result is that we're requiring the box to be far away, which um, is a problem for certain uh, uh, proof techniques that use the coupling. So questions about the, the result? So what does it mean draw between one and four? It's just, yeah, we, we want to have the constant there, C of D, not depend on rho. Okay. So it's probably, we could probably replace that by saying that the constant C depends on rho, but it's uh, continuous on rho. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> hi, Augusto, can I ask you a question? Please. Um, so when you're saying splinting, so, so for uh, random interlacements, you're saying that essentially if you look at the box, and you sprinkle the, there is going to be a good bound on any number of trajectories that can appear in the box, right? For cylinders, is, is it the same? So is it the pieces of cylinder that you're looking for? So yeah, when you sprinkle, you throw a tiny little bit more cylinders into the picture. Uh, and you expect these cylinders to make the person confused. Um, for example, you're looking at two boxes. I tell you what's going on in one of the boxes uh, and you hope to, to be able to distinguish um, the measure in the other box. By having looked at box A, you may have some hope to, to make predictions about box B. 
but the predictions you do for positive for increasing functions um, get dominated by this small sprinkling of traject of traject sorry of uh, cylinders we did in box B. I think it's going to be a bit more clear as you go through uh, the idea of the proof, but that's the basic no, idea. It's, it's okay. It was uh, it, it's Clement, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was not looking a, here in the. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was just uh, wondering if the, the the notion of excursion was the right one. Uh, I mean, the notion of like piece of cylinder was the right one for the notion of excursion in the in the random internalizement case. Yeah, and all the questions we discussed for random talismans are popping up here again. So okay. okay, thanks. By the way, we should gather and discuss that <laughs> and this. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. So I promised you an application, so it's not a super exciting one, but it's something that was unknown before. I told you that we know in dimension three, the cylinders, the vacant set has an infinite component for a small density, right? The vacant set has a phase transition. So if U is small, it has an infinite component. But we proved it by showing that it has a vacant component, an infinite component in a slab. I told you that restricting to a plane is useful, but the plane is, is not percolating. So we reduce it to a slab. And it showed that there is an infinite cluster in this lab. But for example, uh, that makes it a bit two dimensional, right? So we cannot have, for example, a random walk there be transient. If it's restricted to a lab, what we understand, we know we can't prove that a random walk is transient. So this is one application that uh, was unknown before. If you take the ZD just to make random walks instead of brown emotions, it makes life easier. Take the lattice and consider edges between vertices if the edge is fully vacant. If there is a cylinder touching the edge, the edge is dead. But if the edge goes through the vacant set, it's open. Now you have a subset of ZD, of the lattice ZD, and you can make a random walk there and we prove that this random walk in one connected component of this thing, the random walk is transient. So that's one, um, one piece of application. Of course, one would be interested in knowing whether this random walk uh, is satisfying the CLT. Um, other questions that are interesting are like, what happens with first passage percolation on the set? Can we prove a shape theorem. So all these are interesting questions we didn't look at, but this is a small piece of application. And then as a corollary, we know that there is a phase transition. We knew this already before, but it's another proof that uh, there is a percolating phase. If you have a component that is transient for the random walk, it's unbounded. So this unbounded component is part of the supercritical phase. Another question, uh, does, does anybody ever say anything about U star? I mean, it's a big deal in ordinary percolation and you've been silent about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's usually the bounds are so terrible. I think people don't talk about them out of embarrassment. It's usually <laughs> like you don't prove that U star is positive. You prove that it's bigger than yeah, yeah. 5,000 to minus 5,000. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. So what's the idea of the proof? I'm going to be brief. I know that these proofs are uh, not interesting for everyone. But it, you know, I, I try to pick the part of the proof that I find most interesting and maybe inspire someone else. and. I'm cheating quite a bit. There are details that I'm hiding under the rug here. So we have these two boxes, B1 and B2. They're very far away. You can see their mutual distance is much bigger than their side length. And we are drawing these planes pi one and pi two. So we put the boxes 
aligned like this. Um, if they are not aligned, you can just make a bigger box that it aligns beautifully like this. So they're aligned, they're looking at each other somehow, and we draw the plane pi one that is uh, the last plane that touches the box B1 when you look into the direction of B2, and pi two is the other way around. And we use these planes to uh, parameterize our random lines. So every line in the space of lines we have can be characterized by the point they touch one of these planes and their direction, we call D of L. Of course, um, there could be lines that are parallel to the plane and don't touch the plane, but uh, this doesn't happen. It's almost surely not happen. So we can do this parameterization. And if a trajectory is far from touching, the, like if it touches both boxes, it's a problematic uh, line. It's what's going to carry the dependence. But if it's kind of horizontal, it has no chance to touch both trajectories. So just looking at the angle, the direction, we have a very good grasp on whether it's a problematic trajectory or not. Mm -hmm. So we have this definition of the angles that are dangerous. You have to think that these are very small angles because the boxes are very far away. So these very small angles, very aligned with the vertical direction, are the only ones we care about. So we're going to forget all the trajectories that are kind of horizontal and focus on these aligned ones. And don't look at the red and green part of this picture. Look at the middle now. <laughs> So the middle is what? You take the two boxes and you look at only the problematic trajectories, the ones that are very vertical. Sometimes they touch both boxes, like you can see one of them doing there. Sometimes they don't, but they are already, say, of interest, element of interest, if they have this uh, vertical line. And what we're going to do with them is perform a transform. And we are actually going to perform two transforms. So the red one, we call gamma one of eta, fixes the point they touch the lower plane and changes slightly their angle. And the, tra the transform gamma two does the opposite. It fixes the point up there in the upper plane and changes the angle equally. The way you change the angle is kind of, um, it's a transform. It's not just summing a, a random angle. That would not work. It's a transform that is uh, most important is that it's re reversible. So we're taking the angles and making a reversible transform. So if it was problematic before, it's going to be problematic later. And if we look at the measure on angles, it's preserved. OK, so we have these two transforms. And why are they so interesting? So. First, I have to remove a bit of a problem we have with this picture. This picture is a bit exaggerated. So it looks like we changed the angle quite a lot, but it didn't. So the change we're doing the angle is tiny. So that if a traject, if you look at the cylinder, now I'm going to require, can you see the mouse pointer, right? Yeah. So if you look at the dashed line, it had a cylinder around it. If we thicken this cylinder a little bit by epsilon and we rotate the angle a little bit, no matter what we do, it's always going to be contained. So the, the cylinder, the red cylinder, is contained in the thickened cylinder around the dashed line. So it's not visible here because it's exaggerated. But if, if you look at the dashed line, in the thickened cylinder, it contains the non-thickened cylinder of the red line. So in a way, what we are doing with the thickening, at, uh, sorry, of course, this doesn't extend forever, right? If you go far away, then the thickening was very small and the angle starts to adapt. But at least in this box where the rotation happened. So we choose this parameters, the distance between boxes, the angles, and so on, in such a way that the widening of the 
the radius allows for some wiggle room and the boxes are so far away that here it's not exaggerated really the point where it hits the other box moves a lot right that's why it's important to have the boxes far away because even a tiny wiggle room here allows for a big move up there the point they hit it becomes almost uniform and the last thing i wanted to say is that why do we focus on the the white one the middle box because that's where we kind of start. And we can do transformation theta one, oh, sorry, gamma one or gamma two. And the very interesting property of this is that if I tell you gamma one, you have very little information about gamma two. Of course, if I tell you gamma, sorry, eta, you know a lot of information about both the red and green. But if I show you the red, you had to do two rotations and it so much information is lost, lost that from red to green, you have almost no information left. So this is the, the main idea of the proof. Rotate, but rotate twice. And this is the calculation. I'm not going through the details, but I wanted to show just a little bit how this informal, it took us time to take this informal red a green picture and turn it into a proof. So we have a, an expectation of the product. That's what we, that's what's very decoupled. Sorry, very coupled, right? It's a expectation of the product of the same thing, omega, which is the soup of cylinders. First observation, F1 only depends on the problematic cylinders, eta, plus the non problematic cylinders that hit the first box. And F2 depends on the problematic ones plus the non-problematic ones that hit the second box. So you, we see that the dependence is really going through the problematic ones. Now, the fact that rotating them still makes them contained in a thickened cylinder is what allows us to bound this. And the fact that F is monotone increasing, right? We can bound this by a rotated but thickened version. Now we, we are really comparing F1 of this rotated and thickened version with F2 of rotated and thickened by another type of rotation. Now we condition on whatever the F1 needs to go out of the conditional expectation. So F1 goes out and the rest is conditioned on both eta zero, but the, the non-problematic trajectories that hit the first box and the rotated guys. This, this is not going to influence at all. The non, the non vertical cylinders that touch the first box cannot touch the second box. So, this does not influence this conditional expectation. What really is problematic is gamma one of eta. Now, we use this reversibility I told you about. Conditioning on gamma one of eta is the same as you know, putting the gamma one inside here. <laughs> So we are conditioning now on some eta prime, eta tilde, and we are applying the two transforms. So that's what I said. Looking at the red, the eta tilde now should be thought as of red. And this is the green. But to go from red to green, you have to apply two transforms. And this mixes the thing quite well. So unless there is a large deviation in the size of problematic trajectories, that's the exponential term in the error, this double rotation makes the thing dominated by an independent sprinkling of trajectory. So that's where you get the plus delta here. So yeah, sorry to go through the formulas, but it, I don't know. It was... Great, thank you. <laughs> and then I would like to finish with a provocative picture. So I have nothing smart to say about this. I heard that uh, Pablo was interested in something that I'm very curious about to learn more. He will send me the link of his talk, but this is just, you know, for me, it's just a visual appeal. In the left, you have a billiard. In a very normal set, you have two semicircles connected by line segments. And you see that it's quite uh, chaotic, this billiard. And to the right, you have the Poisson process of lines in the plane. 
that we've been talking about. And if they look visually very similar. I don't know what can be said about them. I'm sure the left guy is much harder to understand than the right one. If there is much less dependence going on. Uh, but maybe the fact that the bigger is chaotic can help understand the relation between these two, especially <coughs> because for random interlacements, which I didn't talk about much here, there was there is a strong relation between the infinite model of random interlacements, a soup of infinite trajectories, and the random op in a torus, where you know you keep uh, covering the torus and locally you look like the infinite guy. So maybe here there is an analogy of similar taste. And this is a game I used to play as a kid that clearly shows the interest in studying percolation for the vacant set of seniors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Augusto, for a really nice talk. Is uh, there any question or comment? No question from uh, Sala 224. I, I have a, a, a kind of comment. Uh, so you, it was a wonderful talk, thank you. And uh, uh, you made it clear that cylinder percolation is a subject which has all of its own questions and they're natural within itself. But the way you began was, well, Itai Benjamini asked a question and then somebody invented a model and, and that, so the, the, okay, so the question is the following. Before you were born, um, uh, there was a, a large literature, mostly done in the UK, uh, around people like uh, Rollo Davidson and, and other people on Poisson line processes. It, it's a it's quite a large literature, larger than yours at any rate. And I wonder if there's a connection between the questions that were studied there. If 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 any of you guys ever even bothered to look at it, I don't mean that hostily. You know, it's 50, 70 years old. Who looks at things like that? And, and what you're doing now. That's, so it's a, a question and, or a suggestion, if you like. Does that make sense to you, what I just said? Yeah, I, uh, I've looked a little bit into the, it, so this is a picture actually of the post online process, right? It's uh, they don't thicken the cylinders like we do. Right. Um, the type of results I've seen are very related to the, uh, stochastic geometry kind of right. studies, like they study cells, like how could a large cell appear there? You can see by inspection here that it's hard to find large cells. And if you find they have lots of faces, so this type of uh, deviation are uh, results, for example, how a large cell looks like, or um, how long can you you sorry, how, how much can you cover a certain set? So they, they studied this also in, in networks, like mobile networks type of models. But I definitely have not looked into a lot of literature. So I looked at maybe three, four papers. So I definitely have a lot of homework to do there. there I, it just might be that there's something interesting and when you thicken the lines, which is a good idea, it's new, new to me, maybe you say, ah, you know, that's something, or maybe they know something that'll be useful to you. It, it's a healthy literature, all this, uh, all this wrote about it. And, and well, but uh, it seems to have disappeared from the current <laughs> curriculum. So anyway, thanks. It was a wonderful I'll take talk. a deeper look. Thank you for the reference. I... I also have a comment, uh, by the way, thanks Augusto for a wonderful talk, but um, uh, it's regarding this slide here. Uh, so I don't think uh, I can say anything about the true billiard, but if you take a random billiard uh, where the, ref the, the reflection is random and uh, uses this cosine uh, law, 
uh, and you take it in any domain, then you indeed can prove that you kind of see the POS online process inside. So in this case, right. it's possible. So then the natural question, I mean, thanks for the, the hint. That's an interesting point. Uh, I think, you know, randomness always makes it easier to get the list out of these things. So then the yeah. next question would be like, just like it was done for random walks on torus, can you show that for a three-dimensional billiard, the set that was not visited by the billiard percolates for small uh, times and doesn't percolate for large times? Like there is this phase transition. Now there's- Wow, well, uh, it's a good question. Uh, maybe we should discuss it later. I mean, if you take this, stochastic billiard then i think it should be really doable because it mixes really well and it has kind of the same invariant measure so yeah interesting let's let's discuss it will be easier soon right once i arrive there so there is a question here from the Yeah, hey, so uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, you mentioned that you have this, uh, uh, this requirement to, uh, to have your boxes far away. And you also said that uh, you weren't exactly satisfied with the application. So are there things that you have in mind which would, be, would become doable if you have a, a mixing without this condition? I think that's a very good question. Uh, the main question I have, the, the one that I thought most about and I kind of gave up, and the reason why it was related to the faraway boxes. So if you, I, I'm not saying it's something that's undoable, it's, it's something I thought, but I thought always through the same path. So if someone managed to, to get a decoupling that is not so restricted in terms of the distance of the box, I would suggest thinking about local uniqueness. So what is local uniqueness? We know that for very small values of U, the soup of cylinders is uh, sparse and the vacant set percolates. It percolates, if, if you put a random walk there, it's transient, so it's nice, it's a nice vacant set. But we don't know, first of all, if there is uniqueness of the, giant, of the, infinite, of the unbounded component which is something outrageous because for, uh, from the works of uh, Burton and Keane, this should be automatic, but it's not because this model is not uh, finite energy like this. So we don't know uniqueness and we don't know local uniqueness. Local uniqueness is what would allow us to basically give, prove a CLT for this random walk, uh, prove the thing that I was just discussing with Sergey. I think it's the biggest open question I would like to see. And it's very much related to the distance of the box. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question or comment? Okay. If not, I think uh, we can close the seminar today and see you in next Wednesday. See you, thanks a lot, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.